So we need some more linear algebra to uh, proceed. That's mainly what we're going to be doing today. Um, in particular, we are going to introduce and talk about eigenvalues and eigenvectors. So if we have a vector with just two components, maybe three components at a maximum, we can plot it. And you've probably seen this before, but just so we're definitely on the same page. If you want to plot like one, three on the Cartesian plane, you go to the point one, three, and you connect that point to the origin and you draw it as an arrow. So vectors have lengths. Vectors also, I mean, vectors very literally have lengths. You could use the form to the, the distance form to the, to find the length of this line segment. Vectors also have direction. That arrow is pointing somewhere. Now we can take a vector and we can multiply it by a matrix. We've defined matrix vector multiplication, assuming that, that the sizes match. Um, to A would have to be something by two for our dimensions to match. Let's just assume that A is square. Let's assume that A is two by two. So if we do this multiplication, we'll get a new vector. And there is no reason, I mean, this new vector could be a different length from our old vector. It could be pointing in a different direction from our old vector. So we take one three and we multiply it by A and maybe we get, maybe we get one negative one or something, different lengths, different direction. But it may happen that if we take a vector and we multiply it by A, the original vector and the vector multiplied by A have the same direction. So it could happen that you take your vector and you multiply it by A, and the vector you get from that is pointing in the same direction that the old vector was. So maybe we have a picture like this. Here is our vector V. And here is A times V. Well, multiplying a vector by a um, scalar 
does the same thing. If you multiply a vector by a scalar, it doesn't change the direction of the vector, it just changes its length. So this vector AV is also maybe a little less than a half. Maybe it's two fifths times V. And we therefore have the equality that A times V equals two fifths times V. And this is an example of an eigenvector and an eigenvalue. So let's say that we have a square matrix A. We only talk about eigenvalues and eigenvectors in the context where the matrix is a square. Um, a number lambda is called an eigen value of A if there is a non zero vector B. Such that A times V is the same as a lambda times V. And if we're in this situation, this vector V. is called an eigenvector. So going back to this picture, two fifths is an eigenvalue, and this V is an eigenvector associated with that eigenvalue. So, I mean, the definition, I think, when you see it, it seems a little cryptic, but um, these eigenvalues and eigenvectors are really important in differential equations. In particular, just like we um, solved linear homogeneous equations by looking at the roots of polynomials, we're going to solve um, systems of linear homogeneous equations by looking at eigenvalues. So these are going to play the same role that the roots played in that previous material. Um, before we talk about that, though, we have to um, have to do some linear algebra to make sure we're all up to speed. How do we find? Eigenvalues. 
And maybe, maybe a preliminary question, even before I ask that, does a matrix definitely have eigenvalues? And I'll answer that preliminary question first. Every square matrix has at least one eigenvalue. It might be a complex number, that's fine, but real or complex, every matrix has at least one eigenvalue. Finding them in the real world is something you would do via some kind of iterative algorithm on a computer. So the way that I'm going to teach you to find them really only gets used in classrooms, which maybe raises some questions about the way this gets taught, but... um. An eigenvalue is a lambda that satisfies the equation A times V equals lambda times V. And certainly if we want to, There's nothing to prevent us from taking um, lambda v over to the left-hand side. And now a kind of linear algebra regression. I mean, what we'd really like to do here, at least sort of based on our college algebra, um, you know, high school algebra experience. Um, it seems like the thing to do here is probably to pull that V out and then use some variation of the zero product property. But we can't do that. Um, as we have it written on the whiteboard. And I mean, in particular, the issue here is that A is a matrix and lambda is a real number. And we cannot subtract a real number from a matrix. So, again, only presenting as much linear algebra as we absolutely need for our purposes. But the identity matrix I, capital I, is a square matrix with ones down the diagonal and zeros everywhere else. And I know I used the phrase the identity matrix. I mean, there's a four by four identity matrix, a three by three identity matrix, a two by two identity matrix, and so on. And the identity matrix is the one of linear algebra. If you take a matrix and you multiply it by the identity matrix, it doesn't change anything. You just have the matrix you started with. And because vectors are, are at their core, just special kinds of matrices, 
It's also true that the identity matrix times a vector is just that vector. So what we can do here, just pulling out the V was naive. It, it gave us a matrix minus a real number. That doesn't work. But um, what we could do, not an equality, what we could do is say, well, the matrix V, is the identity matrix times V, because the identity matrix is the one of linear algebra. Throwing in an I doesn't do anything. And now, if we pull that to V out, A, is a matrix lambda times i is a matrix. We have a matrix minus a matrix, and suddenly this little trick means that we can pull that V out. And this equation we're going to come back to um, several times throughout today's lecture. Now, you'll notice back here, I specified that this vector V has to not be the zero vector. And that's because A times the zero vector always equals lambda times the zero vector. This is just the statement that zero equals zero. So without that requirement, Every number would be an eigenvalue. So going back to here, this definitely has a solution, which is that A minus lambda I times zero equals zero, but that's not the solution that's interesting to us. It's, it's not a solution that makes lambda an eigenvalue. So we're just going, you can and no doubt will, if you haven't already, take linear algebra and see a proof of this statement. I'm just going to state it as a fact. A matrix times a vector equals the zero vector as solutions other than the trivial solution V equals the zero vector if and only if the determinant of A equals zero. This is a theorem of linear algebra. 
actually part of quite an important theorem of linear algebra, but we're just going to state it as a, as a known truth. And we're going to take this statement and we're going to look at this equation and we're going to combine those two. We're going to make the statement that lambda is an eigenvalue if and only if a minus lambda i times v equals zero has non trivial solutions. And that's true according to this theorem here, that's true if and only if the determinant of A minus lambda I is equal to zero. So according to what we have on the board, and as I say, there's sort of what we do in the classroom and then what we do if we're actually uh, doing math in applied situations. But according to what we have on this whiteboard, to find the eigenvalues of a matrix, we should find the determinant of something, and we should set that determinant equal to zero, and then we should solve that equation. And the solutions to that equation are going to be the eigenvalues. And this really tying this back to the stuff we did earlier, where we were looking at the roots of polynomials to solve um, differential equations, the determinant of A minus lambda I is going to be a polynomial in the variable lambda. So when we've um when we have a concrete matrix A and we try to use this formula to find the eigenvalues, we're going to end up with something like Lambda squared plus four lambda plus one equals zero. That's what I mean when I say a polynomial in lambda. So finding eigenvalues really comes down to finding roots and there are real world complications here that we're going to skate over. First of all, we have to find a determinant to use this form of a. And if you have a two by two matrix or a three by three matrix, okay, finding the determinant of a two by two matrix, that's easy. Three by three, a little tedious, but we can tough it out. Four by four is 
really pushing it. And I would, it would never, I would not try to find the determinant of a five by five matrix by hand, basically ever. In fact, I said four by four was pushing it. That's really a lie. I wouldn't do four by four by hand either. So this only lets us look at small matrices, this, uh, this understanding of eigenvalues. You're also probably aware that if a polynomial is degree five or higher, there is no quadratic form to the analog you can use to find its root. The only way to find roots of a high degree polynomial is some kind of numerical estimation technique. So that's another kind of practical issue that you'd run into if you try to use this with a 20 by 20 matrix, and now you have a 20th degree polynomial and you need to find its roots. And I mean, of course, it, that's not so bad because, Wolf, well, maybe Wolfram Alpha is pushing it, but something like Mathematica or MATLAB, I mean, you can find roots of large polynomials. But, um, but there are better methods for finding eigenvalues in the practice. In this classroom, we'll probably just work with um, two by two matrices, maybe the occasional three by three matrix, and not worry about kind of the numerical issues that might be underlying this, underlying this. So let's find some eigenvalues. Let, let's see if we can do this in practice. And I'm going to just create A at random. And we'll find the eigenvalues of this matrix A. Well, we're taking a determinant. So in particular, we're taking the determinant of A minus lambda I. And what A minus lambda I is always going to do, because I, is zero except for those ones on the diagonal, A minus lambda I is going to be the matrix A, except that all of the diagonal elements are going to have a minus lambda. The non-diagonal elements are going to remain unchanged. And we find the determinant of a minus lambda i, which for a two by two matrix, we multiply the diagonal elements and the anti-diagonal elements, and we subtract them. So one minus lambda, negative one minus lambda minus six. And this is whatever it is. Negative lambda times negative lambda is positive lambda squared. Um, 
negative lambda times one is negative lambda. Negative lambda times negative one is positive lambda. So those should cancel each other out. One times negative one is negative one. And then we have a negative six. So lambda squared minus seven should be the solution to this. And we are setting this equal to zero. You should I mean, just by virtue of being a math people, you should know the quadratic form above, but we don't need it here because that linear term canceled out. We can just solve this. Lambda equals plus or minus the square root of seven. Going back to something I said earlier, I said that every matrix, every square matrix has at least one eigenvalue. We can now understand that. I mean, it's just the fundamental theorem just, but it's the fundamental theorem of algebra that every polynomial has at least one root. Might be real, might be complex, but every polynomial has at least one root. So, because this, I mean, because these eigenvalues are roots of polynomials, every matrix has at least one eigenvalue. So eigenvalues, are only part of the story. A times lambda equals what am I saying? A times V equals lambda times V. This was the eigenvalue sort of defining equation. So the next question that comes to mind and which we do need to be able to answer in order to proceed in this course is, well, okay, if we found an eigenvalue, if we know that seven and negative seven are eigenvalues, can we find eigenvectors for these eigenvalues? In other words, can we find this vector? I say this vector. Um, I shouldn't say this vector. Every eigenvalue has infinitely many eigenvectors. That's another fact of linear algebra. So I shouldn't say this as if there's only one. Can we find the eigenvectors? Let me warm our calculator up because we are going to need it. And while that's warming up, let's go back a few frames and let's find this equation that I've said I'd come back to. Well, actually, while the calculator is warming up, does anybody have any questions? So if we've found 
if we've already found the eigenvalue, like we, we know that lambda is the square root of seven, then I mean, we know we're going into the problem what this A is. So this A minus lambda I is a known vector. So we have a known, a known matrix, sorry. So we have a known matrix times an unknown vector V equals zero. So to find V here, we look at this. And we ask, can we solve it? So our next item of business, again, really taken from linear algebra, but if you have an equation like this, a known matrix times an unknown vector equals, I mean, here it equals the zero vector. Um, can we solve this? And we're going to learn to solve this as, as a black box algorithm in this class, by which I mean, it's going to be, we're going to feed stuff into our calculator and we're going to get stuff out from our calculator and we're not going to ask questions about what our calculator is doing. But we need, I guess, a little background information here. I mean, our unknown is a vector, right? So we're framing this as finding, as solving for n unknown, but really we're looking for a bunch of unknowns that are going together to form the vector v. Um, So if we have MV equals zero, we are going to create a matrix. And this matrix is going to be M with one additional column act on at the end. It's going to be M with this zero vector on the right of the equality act on to it. And We're going to perform an algorithm called Gauss-Jordan elimination on this matrix. 
matrix. And this algorithm is going to give us a new matrix in a special four. And to understand this, let's look at something more concrete. Like we say we have one, two, three, four times an unknown vector, V1, V2 equals the zero vector. So the thing I want to you to recognize here is that the columns of this matrix correspond to these unknown variables v1, v2. We can rewrite this and it's v1 times the first column plus v2 times the second column equals something. So according to what I said on the previous frame, to solve this equation on this frame, we should take this matrix and we should stick the vector to the right of the equality sign. So we should take that vector zero, zero, and we should stick them together. And the key observation, again, is that in this matrix, these columns correspond to these unknown variables, except for that last column, which corresponds to the Side. Something is equal to that last column. Now we're going to go. to our calculator and we're going to take this matrix and we're going to perform Gauss-Jordan elimination on it. And in our calculator, that's going to be abbreviated in a kind of unnatural seeming way as RREF. So that's, bring up our calculator and let's talk about doing matrix stuff on the calculator. So uh, the result of Texas Instruments having a de facto monopoly is that their calculator is kind of awkward to use and they haven't had to really improve it at all since I was in high school. So there's going to be more button presses here than it probably seems there should be. Matrix is here in blue. 
So we're going to press the second button up here, also blue. Then where I am actually going real quick. Still have the remnants of the linear algebra class from next semester, from last semester. I'm going to get rid of all of that. So we have a fresh star. So we press second, we press this button, and we get into the matrix menu. And we are now going to enter this matrix into our calculator. And we're going to press the use these right and left arrows to move around. We're going to go over to edit. We'll select one of these. It doesn't matter which one. Let's just select the first. And now we can enter a matrix. And it starts by asking us how big the matrix is. So the matrix we have on the whiteboard has two rows, three columns. And now we'll enter the first row, one, enter, two, enter, zero, enter. The second row, three, enter, four, enter, zero, enter. And now we're done here. And we can go back to the matrix menu. So second, Matrix brings us back here, and you'll see that A was blank earlier. Now our cultivator is telling us we have a two by three matrix stored in A. Press the right arrow to get us to math. There's all sorts of stuff here, but we're going down until we get to RREF. Press enter with, oh my goodness. Okay, I keep forgetting how unpleasant our calculator is to work with. Well, I mean, it was my fault, but I, I was here and I was like, okay, now we'll go back to the matrix menu. And our calculator is like, okay, so you want to select something from the matrix menu and put that in here for this entry. All right, fear that, put the one back in. We have to second, we have to quit entirely out of the matrix menu. Then we go back into the matrix menu from the main screen and we select RREF and here we are. Now we go back to the matrix menu for the third time. And we select the matrix we want to hit with gauss Jordan elimination. So we select A. And we press enter. And we get a new matrix. One, zero, 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 one, zero.
Now, the key point here, I emphasized up here that each of these columns corresponds to something. Um, Gauss-Jordan elimination preserves that correspondence. So this first column still corresponds to V1. The second column corresponds to V2. This third column corresponds to equality. Now, um, in addition to each column corresponding to something, or in addition to each column meaning something, each row of this matrix means something. In particular, every row of a matrix like this gives you an equation. The first row gives you what the equation one times V1. Uh, V1 is not a vector. Because you see this one in the V1 column. Plus, and now we have two in the V2 column. So 2v2 equals, we have 0 in the equality column, so equals 0. And the second row, 3v1 plus 4v2 equals 0. Well, this RREF process, this Gauss stored in elimination, preserves that. So every row still corresponds to an equation. And what this algorithm is doing is giving you such simple matrices and such simple equations that they're going to be able to just read V1 and V2 off. This first row now says 1 V1 plus 0 V2 equals 0. That is to say, V1 equals 0. The second row says 0 v1 plus 1 v2 equals 0. So v2 also equals 0. Put them together. The only solution to this equation is the trivial solution, zero, zero. And that, going back however many frames, okay, I don't want to go back however many frames it would take, but this is because this matrix has a non-zero determinant. We had a theorem that there was going to be a non-trivial solution if and only if the determinant is zero. In this particular case, the determinant is negative two. So not surprising that we get this as our solution. But that's um, let's go back. Let's clear some stuff.
Let's go back to this example. We found A and we found lambda. Um, in fact, we found two values of lambda, two eigenvalues, um, plus and minus the square root of seven. Let's now keep this matrix. One, two, three, negative one. And let's select one of our eigenvalues, lambda equals the square root of seven. And let's see if we can find the eigenvectors associated with this eigenvalue. Because solving eigenvectors, finding eigenvectors, is done by solving an equation like we just solved. The matrix times a vector equals zero. Um, A minus lambda I. Remember that puts negative lambdas on the diagonal. So there's A minus lambda I. We want this matrix times V to be a zero. So we'll take this matrix And we will append the zero vector to it. And each column of this appended matrix, augmented matrix, we say each column corresponds to a variable except for the last, which corresponds to a quality. And we will put this in our matrix and we'll hit it with this black box algorithm. And we'll see what happens. Let's see. So, I mean, you have, you have like all of these options. I usually just overwrite matrices when I'm done with them. So let's go back into A, two by three, one minus the square root of seven, one minus, the square root of seven to zero. Three, negative one minus the square root of seven. Zero. And now we'll remember to quit fully out. Back to the matrix menu. RREF is 
just in the middle. Now it's sort of towards the end. I guess you could get to it slightly faster in that direction, but RREF. And here we are, and I'm afraid we get this very ugly decimal. I'll just keep uh, three decimal places. Two, one, five. Close enough. We had a zero there. Then zero, zero, zero. And each of these columns correspond to variables, except the last one, which corresponds to a quality. Each row is, corresponds to an equation. And something interesting has happened here, or at least something different from our previous example, which is that that second row is now not giving us any information, really. It's making the completely trivial statement that zero equals zero. So we're not getting anything from that second row. And that first row says that V1 minus 1.215 V2 equals zero. So V1 is 1.215 V2. So in contrast to the previous example, where we only had one solution and it was the trivial solution. Here we only have this piece of information and there are an infinite number of vectors that we can select that will satisfy this equality. Like to me, the most, the most obvious one is that if we let V2 be one, V1 must be one point two one five. So there's an eigenvector, but you could also let you could also let V2 be two. And V1 is twice that, 2.430, if I'm doing that correctly. So any value of V2 gives you an eigenvector except for zero. That's the only forbidden value. If you let it be zero, you get zero, zero, and zero, zero is never an eigenvector by definition. But any other value is. So, I mean, that was quite the, quite the crash course, but I think that that's all we're going to need as far as eigenvalues or and eigenvectors go. And that 
puts us, well, at, at about the end of the class, first of all, but then it puts us in a very good position. We should be able uh, to finish this section off on Thursday as planned. And I will see you then.